Hey guys, today I wanted to talk a little bit about a company that I've been following for quite a while now called Travel Sky Technologies. Now, this is a it's an interesting business, Chinese business, uh, registered in Hong Kong. Um, and basically, it's one of these like, you know, brain dead businesses, um, a natural monopoly uh, perhaps it could be run by a ham sandwich, so long as there's some other people there that know what they're doing. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting business along the same kind of lines that an Amadeus or a Saber or even a travel port would be um, in the West. Now, if you're not familiar with those businesses, they all operate a few different business lines, but they all operate the, the GDS in travel, which is the global distribution system. Now, these uh, businesses have historically been extremely long run. The first GDSs emerged, I believe, in the late 1960s. They emerged in the West out of a need for um, the airlines to distribute their ticket sales in a way that um, was not going to encumber their business. So, you know, typically the airlines were focused on planes, routes, flying, customer service, that kind of thing. They weren't typically um, focused on the distributional sales of their tickets. It's something that happens across quite a large number of industries. Like you might think in the car industry, um, sales of the actual cars are usually de decentralized down to the to a dealer level or in, in, in plenty of businesses there's a distribution um, the person who controls or the company that controls distribution is not the same who creates that product um, and there's a number of reasons why that happens but in in the history of air travel in the 1960s and 70s various air travel providers um, uh, got together and in Europe these were government entities later in China these were also government entities but in the United States typically they were private enterprises um, and they got together um, and developed a system for travel agents to be their outsourced sales arm which has um, you know, this has kind of gone back and forth um, over time as, as travel agents got more influence, ability to sell, et cetera, that gave them more leverage over the airlines. And so um, in recent years, and especially with the emergence of OTAs, uh, many airlines across the planet have been looking to go direct to consumer, you know, with their own websites to sell tickets directly to um, get around some of these GDS services, which um, can be quite costly for them to operate in. Um, in the terms of an Amadeus, because that's the it's not an exact analogy to, to Travel Sky, but Amadeus um, operates the, uh, the ticketing software. So they're uh, for, for air travel, uh, mostly ex China, that most of the world ex China. And basically, their model works along a couple of different ways, but um, they charge incredibly high rents on the uh, airlines. Um, so those can be like 10, 15% of the cost of a ticket. Um, sometimes more, it's a fixed cost. It varies a little bit in the West, but um, they have essentially been increasing the prices of the tickets. And this has changed ex post COVID, but pre COVID, um, you know, they were increasing the prices of what it costs to process a ticket by something like 15% a year, which is a remarkable number. Um, if anyone could compound the value of their portfolio at 15% a year for a very long period of time, that would be like an outstanding result. You're doubling the cost um, or you're doubling your revenue simply on pricing power every five years. It's not even taking into account um, more people traveling over time. Um, but it's a, it's a phenomenal business. It's a, a natural monopoly the way, and to get back to how Amadeus performs, essentially they, they charge uh, the airlines quite a high processing fee per per ticket they sell, and they incentivize travel agents to sell those tickets with kickbacks. So they share that commission percentage with travel agents, 
Now it's not as straightforward as that. Typically travel, um, Amadeus will also charge an upfront fee, like an annual subscription fee for travel agents to have access to the ticket, to be able to sell the tickets. So it, it, it's a phenomenal business. You can see, you know, just what a powerful position they sit um, with all the constituents um, in their kind of ecosystem, which is, is good. It, it's also resulted um, in the, late, the years up to COVID in significant eff efforts to get around the GDS. So there was a, a, a project sort of started in the early 2010s called the NDS, which is the new distribution system. Um, and it really didn't even make a dent. So uh, that, that, that was essentially a disbanded, I believe, in 2020, 21, um, due to COVID. It's one of the things that's made these businesses more interesting that COVID has essentially eradicated all of their competition. Um, there was also a, a pretty famous example of uh, Air Hansa uh, in Germany trying to leave the GDS. Um, and they sort of had to come back on their, their scraping on their hands and knees to, to get admitted back in. Um, interestingly, I think it's Southwest in the United States, you know, a, um, a very low cost airline and they're known for sort of penny pinching on all expense items and, and that kind of thing, a little bit like Ryanair. Um, and they're pretty famous for not participating in uh, the GDS. They go directly to customers so they can save customers, you know, that extra five, 10, 15% um, of their ticket cost. Um, so while the Western version of this business is certainly higher returns on equity assets, um, and it really doesn't take much incremental capital to, to grow this business, they're just simply raising their prices um, year after year after year. Uh, it's also, you know, caused quite a lot of angst in the um, constituents to this business. Um, and you can probably see over time especially, you know, that they're probably looking at about five or six years of unfettered competition in the home market in the West for, for the likes of Amadeus. Um, but, but over time, that will incentivize more and more people to try different things and will incentivize a lot more airlines to go direct, um, especially, you know, as their, as their internet efforts become uh, more sophisticated, which is just inevitable over time. So those interesting businesses, um, they've been... Um, quite good returners for shareholders since they've gone public. Um, the Chinese version of this is a company called Travel Sky Technologies, which is, I've written it up on the blog. Um, it's had a few posts on um, Twitter. A few people have written it up. There's been some short reports. It was written on um, at the 2019 Sone conference. Um, somebody made a long pitch for it as well. Uh, it's a very interesting business. It kind of ticks all the qualitative factors of, you know, just immense, um, it's an immense natural monopoly. It's not, it's not going anywhere. The questions are always over uh, other things about, you know, how the business is being managed, how the capital is getting allocated um, and its general financial performance. Because as we know in China, um, the incentives um, for especially state-owned enterprises are not always to achieve you know, the absolute highest returns on equity. Um, quite often the capital that they create or the societal outcome that they're operating to achieve, um, it's, um, it, it's a wider societal thing. You know, they're not trying to optimize for returns on equity and return as much capital to shareholders and bring as much money out of their customers and ecosystem constituents as they can. Quite often they're trying to fulfill a societal um, objective that the government has. Um, so it's a very interesting business. This one it, it differs from its Western peers in a few ways that I'll get to. Um, but essentially, it's the dominant provider of um, you know the ticketing software, um, also hardware um, in the air travel uh, industry in China. It's listed in Hong Kong, so it's very easy uh, listing to get a hold of really simple to um, buy those shares on, inter on interactive brokers or something like that. Um, it's a super high quality business and especially with COVID and the Chinese government's continuing crackdown um, on, 
on COVID and its desire to achieve a zero COVID outcome, um, it's had a very depressed valuation. Um, and these have been compounded by things like, you know, general pe pessimism in China um, and uh, a growing spread in valuations between the Hong Kong listed SOEs and the mainland listed SOEs, which have held up, you know, pretty decently. So the core business is the GDS, the global distribution system, commonly referred, you know, referred to as GDS um, for Chinese air travel. They also, uh, their software offering is a lot more extensive than an Amadeus, for instance. Um, they do inventory management, um, basically the entire ecosystem of software that, that operates um, an airport, they, they, they do the whole thing. Um, so typically the, the, the GDS um, or the Aviation Information Technology Services, they report it. Uh, it's a little bit over half of the revenues. Um, and uh, this central business is not subject to competition. So when the Civil Aviation Board in China um, began developing this system in the, I believe it was early 90s, late 80s, um, the Chinese government were very, uh, they were very, um, uh, mindful that uh, that a foreign that this was a, a, an incredibly good business that foreign players could uh, create a dominant position in. So they were mindful they wanted to do this themselves. Um, and so the business, you know, it's majority owned by the three large airlines, and the airlines are in turn controlled by the Civil Aviation Board. Um, and the Civil Aviation Board is part of the government. So it's essentially government owned. Um, in the core business, you know, it's 98% market share. It operates in all the, um, it operates, you know, the, the system for all the airlines and it operates um, in all the airports in China. And so it's a really compelling growth story as consumers become more, as, as they uh, sort of gentrify in China, obviously air travel um, is something that people become more interested in, not just for business, but also for leisure. And certainly as China becomes more inward focused rather than outward focused, um, you know, those, those travel destinations will be less about going overseas and probably more about staying home, which presents its own risks. One of the big risks that people bring up about this is the um, development of high-speed uh, of high speed uh, train services, um, which I don't think is a real threat, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so, air, air, uh, the, the volumes um, of people traveling via air within China and um, from China to outbound and outbound to inbound into China, uh, that number has been catering at about 11% for the last two decades which is a you know, very secular growth story. As more people join the middle class, more people travel, more people travel on planes. Um, and so you can see the travel volumes here. It's extremely impressive. Um, you know, it's a premiumization of the Chinese consumer, basically. Um, and naturally, as COVID-19 hit at the beginning of 2020, volumes declined precipitously, along with revenues, et cetera. Now, the beginning of COVID was quite different from the beginning in China. It was very different from how, you know, COVID played out in the West. So obviously they had a very strict militant lockdown at the beginning. Um, and then either through, you know, the very hard lockdowns to start with and then perhaps fudging the numbers or lying or whatever, um, they essentially resumed um, civil society extremely quickly. So the the air um, the air volumes actually in, in parts of the country in the three or four months after the initial COVID outbreak pretty much bounced back to 2019 volumes right away. Now that was um, not a permanent state of affairs. Obviously, as we got into um, 2021, larger societal trends became more at play. The government started cracking down on individual businesses, et cetera. Um, you know, 2021, 2022 are these years where uh, people running the government in China 
um, are trying to secure their spot for the next um, sort of governmental terms. Xi Jinping's, you know, consolidating, locking everything down in the run up to that. Um, and so, you know, in 2021, you had uh, the big cases against, you know, Jack Ma miss, get, you know, getting missed, um, companies being delisted from the New York Stock Exchange, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone's pretty familiar with the story. Um, and so, uh, you know, these broader themes began to lock down the economy and broader society. And basically, this is still happening. Um, there's been some kind of offshoots that maybe things are turning around a little bit. The government is uh, softening entry standards into the country um, with regards to the kind of testing that needs to take place for COVID. So ultimately, they, you know, my take would be that they cannot continue on with this extreme COVID zero policy forever. Um, but you, you, you just simply don't know in a place like this how far the government is willing to go, especially when its own survival um, could be on the line. So, you know, that's a bit of a, um, a question up in the air. Originally, originally, when I wrote this article, I thought that air traffic um, would kind of, you know, bounce back in line with the West. That's certainly not the case. I thought volumes would be, you know, approaching 2019 levels at the end of this year, 2022. That's probably not likely. Um, and we've got no indication of when it might come back. Um, but eventually, you know, they will have to, um, you know, join the rest of the world in normal society again. Um, simply a question of when. Um, the, the core business, it's one of these um, examples of a pre-installed base of software, which is, you know, has high switching costs and a kind of uh, limited network effect. These are the same kind of business. You know, this is kind of like a, a Microsoft type business. It's an operating system for an airline and how an airline would distribute this, their seats um, in China. So once the inventory management and the central GDS is being used by the airport and the airlines and the travel agents and being used by guests, um, you know, it's, incredibly difficult to to switch that product and so all of the airlines they own a part of this business it's within their best interest to um, have this set up and i'll get into some of the costs later but essentially it's it's many multiples it's many orders of magnitude cheaper um, on a per ticket basis for them to run this system than it would be if they were to run a system like amadeus um, so yeah you know it's typically you know a complete nightmare installing software for even small teams of people, I can't even imagine what it would take to um, have, you know, several hundred airports change this system. Um, yeah, not to get too cute, but the core business could be run by, by a ham sandwich. The, the most reasonable comp for Travel Skies Amadeus, like I've mentioned, which has um, a significant market share in the West. Um, Amadeus is a good example of how great this business can be as just like travel sky it's a toll booth on all air travel um like i was mentioning before amadeus uses their market position um in an extremely aggressive way and you know basically i was saying you know the the cost per ticket for using the likes of an amadeus um can be you know 10 15 plus percent of the of the cost of a ticket um and those prices are paid, you know, essentially by the airlines, rebated to the travel agents, or costs get passed on to the guest eventually. So the, the cost of, um, you know, per ticket for the airlines to use Travel Sky is less than 1% of the cost of a ticket. Um, obviously, those prices might have gone a little bit haywire during the COVID period, but that's certainly what they were pre-COVID. And so one of the criticisms of the company has been that because it charges uh, such a modest fee, um, that the returns that the business could generate are, you know, it's, it's essentially underperforming, you know, underperforming. And that underperformance is being uh, pushed by the, its ecosystem constituents, the, tra the, um, the airlines and by the government. And so that is an unavoidable part of operating a monopoly within China. The government has regulated that basically this, this company's you know, return on capital is pretty much capped out at around about 15%. If you look at its returns on equity, its return on capital, it's, um, 
return on assets. Um, they're pretty modest for what you would think, especially when you have a look at their uh, margin profile, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, that is that is certainly the downside. The the upside for something like this is um, you can probably call this a more rational pricing model. Um, Amadeus's pricing model is um, basically borderline predatory. Nobody likes participating in the system. Um, the low cost for for Travel Sky operating means that um, the people that operate, you know, its customers, its suppliers, eventually the uh, traveler on um, um, on airplanes, they essentially all pay lower costs um, for this vital part of the service. So that can probably be seen as more rational. Um, over time, and you never know where these things can go, but um, it's it has tremendous latent pricing power. So at any point in the future, if the government allows this company to earn um, greater returns, or perhaps it gets privatized. Who knows? The likelihood that the um, that this company can perform much better in the future than it is now, and pre-COVID performed, you know, just fine. Um, that that performance could be many orders of magnitude greater than than what it is now. Again, an unlikely an unlikely outcome, but something to keep in mind. So pre-COVID, it was flexing, you know, thirty percent. Uh, Pre, um, pre-tax you know, income margins. The net income margin is a few percentage points below that. Um, and you know, it, it historically has paid out between you know, a third or two thirds of its net income. I think it's two thirds of cash flow um, as dividends. So the dividend has increased over its life cycle. Um, and that's a return of capital coming directly back to the shareholders. They could they could afford to pay a much larger dividend to their shareholders or you know, even retire stock that they're, they're doing this for a reason. Um, so it's not what I would call like the most optimal use of their capital. And if you have a look at their balance sheet, there's um, a bunch of other things which are not extremely optimal, but um, um, you kind of take them with a grain of salt because of where you're operating and the nature of the ownership structure. Essentially, uh, they, you know, they have, I think it's almost a fifth of the market cap at the moment as cash on the balance sheet. Um, holding that cash pre-COVID seemed a bit silly. After COVID, um, quite prudent. Um, they continued to earn net income through COVID and, and even now are still profitable. Um, but that uh, cash cushion, you know, the, the the likelihood that this business became obsolete, went out of business, faced bankruptcy, was essentially zero. Several years of operating expenses on on the balance sheet. Um, part of that cash is held within what are called um, market. Uh, um, I forget what the investment securities, um, like these investment products. Uh, that basically have you know, incredibly low yields. So I think it's over a billion and a half Hong Kong dollars are held within these um, wealth management investment products, which essentially just yield about 3% a year. Um, historically, that cash being invested in those products within China over the last decade, that's a massive misallocation of resources, essentially. I think returning that capital to shareholders um, would have been you know, a much more prudent um, way to allocate that capital. But again, this is China and um, this business is not necessarily being run 100% in the best interests of the shareholders. It's more being run in the best interests of everyone who participates. So you can see here, you've got the, the kind of three large um, uh, aviation companies in China. Um, you've got some small airlines who own a piece um, as a holding company, and then you've got the H shares. So 31% of um, Travel Sky shares are listed in Hong Kong. Um, on the other side, you've kind of got, um, you know, the operating subsidiaries of Travel Sky, so associates, branches, and subsidiaries. Um, this is clearly going to be a company that benefits from the reopening. Uh, that is very clear um, when the news came out this week that um, some of the entry 
criteria to visit China were uh, ameliorating. It was basically up seven, eight, nine, ten percent on the day, um, and it's been a pretty decent performer this year. Um, it's also capturing this longer-term structural play on the cons you know consumption trends of a rapidly prospering middle class in China. Um, that you know the number of people flying on planes, uh, the volumes of tickets being sold, again, have been, have been compounding at about 11% for the last 20 years, um, which is a pretty incredible number. And even while the population of China is not growing rapidly, the, the delta in the move here is the people still uh, graduating economic classes. So people moving from the rural peasantry um, and then moving up the grades into the middle class. That's, the, um, that's where the secular growth trend is coming from, not, um, not the you know, um, population growing in China. Um, so it's gonna greatly benefit from these increasing volumes. Um, more volumes means they clip more of the tickets for air travel. And on an ancillary note, they also benefit from the opening of new airports. So while the GDS and the technology solutions make up about 55% of um, their revenue, they also derive quite a bit of their revenue from uh, the installation of their IT systems in new airlines, no, sorry, in new airports. Um, so while they have the, this great core cool monopoly business, they also have a business in fitting out new airports. So um, China's committed to essentially opening between 10 and 14 new airports a year for the next 10 years, um, which means e even though the installation business is not recurring revenue, it's probably not even very high margin revenue, it is still revenue that the company will continue to accrue for a very long time. Um, and you can kind of contrast this with other places in the world where, say, in the likes of Europe or the United States, in the United States, the number of new airports being opened is very modest. There's essentially no growth. And in mainland Europe, um, the number of airports are decreasing uh, every year. So the, the new airports um, indicate uh, more outlets basically for travel sky tickets to be sold on more airports allow for even more travel kind of builds on itself to a point um, there will be a saturation point in the future um, but you can see how these things kind of build on themselves um, so yeah apart from the IT systems there are a bunch of um, uh, ancillary business lines you know here I talked about the civilian airports opening new ones um, the, the IT installation business actually posted positive year-on-year -year growth going into 2020. It'll probably not grow in 2021 because um, of the government's wider policy around COVID zero. Um, they've also got other reporting headlines, which are quite small, you know, data networks and others. They used to participate uh, in their own OTA type businesses. Um, they've got a payments business, a hotel reservation system, and a few other miscellaneous bits here and there um, they probably these business these other business lines are pretty weak um, uh, typically they've they've had some high growth uh, stuff here and there nothing ever really sits that hard um, so none of these small businesses ever hit that hard and you don't really need to count on them they're kind of like you know free tickets maybe you know one of them does okay and the rest of them kind of die off um, but it's you know these are these are not things to be be too concerned about. Now the valuation. So when I wrote this company up, it was about forty eight uh, billion Hong Kong dollars, um, and it's around about that price today. It's around about fifteen dollars and twenty four cents. Uh, in the last year, it's basically gotten it's sort of lapped the COVID lows. Um, it got back to about ten dollars. Uh, and 64 cents. It might have even been uh, lower than that intraday. During the sort of COVID collapse, it was just around about the same price. Um, so, you know, earlier on this year, it was kind of, uh, you know, trading in the 30 billion market cap range, Hong Kong dollars. And that's still with a very large amount of cash on the balance sheet. So the enterprise value was 
within the, the 20s. Now, this is a company that earned in 2019 uh, two and a half billion uh, Hong Kong dollars a year. Um, so, you know, on an EV to EBIT basis, it was basically trading at 10 times earlier this year. Um, and even now it's probably, you know, 16 times 2019 earnings. Typically the company's traded at a valuation more in the range of uh, 19 times trailing 12 month earnings. So even at its current price, it's kind of modestly under where it is. Um, and we kind of haven't seen these valuation levels in quite a long time, probably since 2013, 2014. And so the real question is just really when is travel going to normalize in China? And the, the answer to that is really no one knows. Um, I think in the West, you'll kind of see, you've seen a you know, revenge travel come back as quickly as people could. I think that's probably um, very much the same in mainland China itself with the lockdowns being so much harsher. Um, and, you know, perhaps, you know, the nationalism going on, um, the uncertainties around COVID is that for several years, people may resort to domestic travel instead of going on uh, large international trips where the risk um, that you won't actually be able to get where you're going or you're going to lose your deposit or your trip will be cancelled, X, Y, and Z. Um, that's still quite high. That's even quite high in certain places for domestic travel. Um, so that, that, part, that part kind of bodes well. Um, the international travel so the, the part of revenues for the GDS that come from international travel have historically been quite low in the 10 to 15% range. Um, so that's a small part of the business, but that is probably a business that does not recover for some years. Um, but all else being equal, you do have the IT installation business and you do have the, um, the domestic GDS business, which, you know, will will continue growing for 10 plus years. Um, this is one of those businesses where it's quiet. You, you, you can make a very decent bet that this business is gonna be around in another 10 years. It has essentially survived the nuclear apocalypse um, of the travel industry. You can't think of basically anything worse except for maybe a large kinetic war uh, breaking out, a large kinetic war breaking out in the next 10 years. I'll, I'll leave that up to you, whether you, how likely you think that is. In that kind of environment where the West and China completely decouples and uh, goes into a hot war, it's, you know, probably everything's going to do poorly. Um, but people still need to travel by plane around the country, that's for sure. Um, so, yep, you're getting this at about 16 times 2019 earnings. Obviously, earnings and revenues have been crushed in the last two years and that kind of need to be normalised. Um, Again, the question is just when it gets back to gets back to trend, and that could, you know, probably pushing my forecast out a couple of years now, probably 2023, 2024. Um, perhaps after Xi gets reconfirmed, um, certainly the government has been easing monetary policy and enacting incentives to get the economy going again after some of the, you know, own goals they scored against themselves last year. Um, so. You know, that, that's kind of where I'm standing at that. Like, with Amadeus, that, this is a business which is historically traded on a premium on a 30 to 40 times earnings multiple. Um, and they, they deserve that multiple. They are absolutely maximizing the economic value of their product um, and their capital allocation. Essentially, a large portion of their cash flows get um, put towards retiring stock every year. So that's a business that should trade on a multiple of something like that, especially where, um, you know, you, you, they've probably got a very decent chance that they're going to be in a very similar position in 10 years, perhaps even longer. Um, it'd be very difficult to see these systems getting ripped out. I'm not saying that they can't, um, but there's, you know, a very high chance, very, very, very high chance that they're very profitable um, on the same sort of economic trajectory than they are now. Um, so you, you're kind of getting this at half or less of, you know, typically what you could get Amadeus at. Earlier this year, you probably would have been getting it at 25% of what you, you'd typically get Amadeus at. And you do have some, and, and the company is still paying a dividend, even though that dividend has been crushed. 
um, because the earnings have also been crushed. Um, if you had bought this at like 10 Hong Kong dollars a share, um, the last normalized dividend was 30 cents. So that's kind of like a three and a bit percent uh, dividend yield on 2019 numbers, uh, which is not bad, especially as they've grown that dividend over time. So that dividend has grown, you know, since it's gone public in 2005. Um, and, you know, as the business continues to do well, which it should, um, you know, you're going to participate in some of that once things normalize. Uh, so the risk to this business, um, obviously there's several risks. Um, the first is the capital allocation that we've talked a little bit about. Uh, there's always the threat that um, the cash that the company generates is not used particularly well. Uh, like we've talked about, quite a bit of their cash has been invested in wealth management products, which have a very poor return. Um, a large amount of cash is kept on the balance sheet. It's not returned to shareholders in any way. Um, and the company just continues to print cash kind of year after year, uh, even during COVID, which was you know, kind of amazing. So you will, you will get this modest dividend over time. That dividend will grow as the business grows. That's quite um, attractive. And there's always the chance that um, these businesses get rationalized over time. Um, pricing power comes online. They decide to pay a special dividend. They have paid a special dividend once, I believe in 2008. Um, so those are all possibilities and they're all positive catalysts. Um, obviously the kind of uh, not suboptimal, but certainly suboptimal for this business return on capital will continue um, in lieu of the government deregulating things. Um, with the event of COVID and the things happening in the Chinese economy, the likelihood that the government continues COVID zero for an extremely long period of time um, uses it as a front to basically crush domestic opposition. Um, no one knows how long that's going to continue, even though there are green shoots at the moment of that being reversed somewhat. Uh, the likelihood that this business is, you know, made obsolete or is worked around is essentially zero. Somebody had a very good post on Twitter from the Sone conference um, about Travel Sky's uh, competitive positioning, and they kind of alike and, and liken it to ERP software uh, rather than an Amadeus type system, as it's embedded in you know the vast sprawl of these IT processes that make an airport and airlines run. And, um, you know, that, that, that is a true part of the business model. Um, they sit in between all parties. They don't kind of prey on top of or um, have ways for people to get around. So like I mentioned in the West, um, almost all parts of the travel ecosystem are attempting to circumvent the GDS in one way or another, um, even though they've been unsuccessful. And in my mind, that's simply a matter of time. If you have people actively out there willing to invest capital over multi-decade periods to get around your system, uh, eventually they will. And, you know, it's, it's piece by piece. So the OTAs go direct, consumers go direct, um, people invest in new, in new distribution systems, et cetera. Like this business probably continues, it probably, you know, Amadeus probably continues and does very well. Um, but over time that will be kind of chipped away and you can already see it. Uh, the way Travel Sky is operating, you know, that risk is much lower. So I gauge product uh, obsolescence very low. Um, there's always this risk of a permanent permanent change in travel behaviours. Um, I don't think this was a bigger, a bit as big a risk as I first thought about this this time last year. Um, we were still in the throes of the COVID lockdowns, and it was unclear to me whether. Um, permanent changes had been made to the public psyche about uh, where and what they wanted to do with their uh, entertainment dollars. Um, I don't really have that fear anymore. I, I believe this is probably true of most people living in other countries as well, is that as soon as the borders went up, they wanted to go. Travel's a, uh, it, it's a long-term secular trend. As people get wealthier, they want to travel. Traveling's fun as a part of the human spirit, which is uh, nomadic um, and so I think that that is probably a, a much lesser risk factor um, as what I saw what I mentioned before though in terms of international travel um, and perhaps parts of business travel um, they may be restricted or changed permanently 
um, the international travel probably does not return to pre-COVID levels until the convenience of traveling returns to an acceptable level. Um, traveling overseas is, is a nightmare at the moment, even with a lot of the restrictions coming down, you still have to get these tests. Um, you know, a big, a big trip uh, that might cost $25,000, $45,000, you know, a big trip with a large group of people. Those are becoming very high risk things to do. Um, and the, the memory that a lot of people have pre-COVID of losing their deposits on trip like this is, is still in their mind and it's more materially, it's still a risk. Um, but, there, but there's pent up demand for this travel. So my thoughts on that had been that a lot more travel would stay domestic. Um, the marginal travel dollar will probably go towards, you know, maybe you go to a different state, a different part of the country, um, which is, uh, you know, you can have a lot more certainty around what's going to happen there. Uh, with corporate travel, uh, I think that that'll come back slower uh, than usual. The, the tools for doing business over the internet are, uh, are a lot better than what I thought they would be pre-COVID. You've got Zoom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those all work completely fine. You can close deals with those. Um, you don't need to go and meet people in person. But I think um, that that will kind of normalize over a longer time period. Um, but executives have seen that, you know, business work completely well when everyone's stuck in their bedroom. So that's that. Um, so those were my thoughts on the company. It's, you know, it's a very uh, interesting, durable company. It has some great um, growth drivers to it. It's got a decent capital return policy. Um, it is operating in China. So though that, that has risks, um, especially at the societal level. Um, but it's something definitely worth looking into um, with the world returning to normal, travel volumes, uh, getting around the same kind of things. And, and this is a company that's not really subject to a lot of those uh, extreme left tail events, which would have the whole company you know, become obsolescent. This isn't a business that needs to reinvent itself or um, co even come out with basically any new products ever, um, so long as the, the products remain usable. Um, and that's about it. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting company. Um, you know, let me know your thoughts.